Thank you very much. It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, earlier this year, the government made some sudden and very specific changes to the official plans of six municipalities. Uh, they carved up 4,700 hectares of farmland and green space for more sprawl, leaving municipalities scrambling. Now, the NDP official opposition has obtained an internal government memo that reveals stark warnings about, and I quote, potential contentious issues that could come from these changes. It warns relations with First Nations would be hurt, that forcing this on municipalities would override all the work they've done on local planning. Speaker, to the Premier, why did the government push ahead with these drastic changes despite these very serious warnings from their own staff? The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, of course, uh, we were working, we're working constantly with our municipal partners. Uh, we've made it very clear to all of our, our municipal partners that we uh, intend to build 1.5 million homes across the province of Ontario. We haven't made that a secret. It is something that uh, has driven us since 2018. At the same time, we are seeing uh, thousands of people coming to the province of Ontario from other parts of, uh, of Canada to, uh, uh, to participate in what is the economic growth and prosperity here in the province of Ontario. At the same time, uh, 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 over the next decade, millions of people will come from all over the world. And because of that, Mr. Speaker, not only because of people coming from other parts of, the, of, uh, of Canada, not only because of the immigration that is coming to this country, but because we want fundamentally to get people out of their parents' basements and into homes, whether it's Response. apartments, whether it's a home of their own, Mr. Speaker, we are going to continue to focus on building homes for the people of the province of Ontario, despite the opposition. Supplementary question. Speaker, that answer is not going to cut it, because this is not happening in a vacuum. This is a land grab happening at the same time as this government was carving up the green belt. Order. Let's look at Barrie. The government actually reduced density targets for new developments in Barrie, and that means higher infrastructure costs for people in Barrie and more sprawl. But guess what? Bigger bucks, bigger bucks for a select few land speculators. The government's memo warned that these changes would make it harder for the city to meet its own housing targets. Speaker, to the Premier, if this was actually about housing, why is his government pursuing policies that will make it even harder for future generations to find a home? To reply, the Premier. Well, well, Mr. Speaker, Mayor Nuttall's doing a great job up in Barrie. He wants to build homes. He wants to contribute. He has capacity with his water and sewage. And he's asking to build more homes. That's why we're doing it. We consulted with the mayor, and uh, we're going to build the 1.5 million homes that the opposition doesn't want to build. Do you notice they don't want to do anything? They vote against building homes, vote against building hospitals, vote against long-term care. They vote against expansion of roads and highways and bridges. They vote against Order. everything. This province would be a disaster if you were ever on the side of the, the aisle here. Final supplementary. Tell you what, Speaker, we need we need that premier to do a better job. We need that premier to do a better job. Speaker, the memo the memo also covers this government's 2,300 hectares of forced sprawl in Waterloo Region, throwing out all of the consultation and the planning work that the region had already done. The government's own internal memo warned against this, and it said that. Third-party requests were prioritized over evidence-based solutions by expert planners. Right there. This government knew this was wrong. Yep. They knew it. So, Speaker, back to the Premier. Why did his government proceed with this plan for forced boundary changes, and who made these third-party requests? Members, will please take their seats. To respond. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Mr. Speaker, what's, what's exciting about that question isn't that the, the, the fact that the NDP don't want to build homes. What's exciting about that question is it underlines the economic success that we are seeing Order. in the Kitchener-Waterloo area, right? Yeah. In southwestern Ontario.
Ontario. We're seeing that despite the opposition of the NDP and, and the Liberals. The Liberal, the Liberal leader, the interim Liberal leader, just called building houses Order. a virus. He called it a virus, and that underpins 15 years of Liberal government rule in the province of Ontario. It is not a virus Order. to have people have Order. a home ownership that generations of Ontarians have wanted, Mr. Speaker. It is not a virus for Ottawa South come to order. Thousand people have the dignity of a job that didn't when he and the NDP were in power in the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Pause. We're growing. Uh, we're a province that is growing. Our communities are growing, and they want to participate with us. They want to build homes. They want to meet those targets, and many of our communities want to exceed the targets. Right. And we'll give them the the next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, back to the Premier. There is a reason that we need to pay close attention to the amendments to official plans. It was amendments to York's official plan where the government quietly signaled plans to open up two more protected greenbelt sites to speculators. The Premier says he will supposedly reverse this greenbelt grab, so will he also reverse the changes to York's official plan? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. No, Mr. Speaker, because the land she referenced were never actually removed from the green belt, Mr. Speaker. She forgot to mention that. But what we will continue to do is across the province of Ontario, where we are making billions of dollars investments in transit and transportation, Order. where we're building brand new GO train stations, we will intensify and ensure order. that we build homes around those infrastructure investments, Mr. Speaker. And it again underlines what's happening in York Region. We have people who need employers in York Region. When you come to downtown Stouffville, help wanted signs are in the windows because the economy is booming. Our agricultural sector is booming. Our, our, our high-tech sector in Markham is booming. It kills the opposition because for 15 years they worked with the Liberals to bring the province to its knees. Response. I'm excited because you know what? The Ontario that we have today is booming. It's moving in the right direction. It's because of this Premier and this caucus, and we won't stop. Order. Restart the clock. Supplementary. That's a no, Speaker. That's a no. Interesting because guess who that benefits? Guess who that benefits? Another speculator with ties to the premier Order. and to his party. Speaker, the integrity commissioner revealed evidence suggesting Michael. I could not hear the member who duly had the floor. Interjections are always out of order. I will continue to call out members by name, if need be. Start the clock. Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, and I'll, I'll start over again. Uh, because guess who Order. those changes benefit? Another speculator with ties to this Premier and his party. Speaker, the Integrity Commissioner revealed evidence suggesting Michael Rice asked for a parcel of land in Richmond Hill to be removed from the Greenbelt. Land he didn't yet own. But Mr. Rice seemed to know that this government was planning to open up this land for speculators. So he made a deal to buy the land at a rock-bottom price, and then this government changed the boundaries to include his property, driving its value up dramatically. Did the Premier and did this government give preferential treatment to Mr. Rice? Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, absolutely not, because the land was never removed from the Greenbelt, Mr. Order. Speaker. The land was never removed from the Greenbelt. It was never removed from the protection of the Oak Ridges Moraine Land Planning Act, Mr. Speaker. That change never happened. But you know what we're going to continue to do? We're going to continue to do what they don't want us to do. We're going to continue to focus on building an economy that is stronger than ever. We're going to continue to focus on making sure that the next generations of Ontarians can get out of their parents' basement and can go find a home of their own. We're going to continue to focus on policies that have given us more housing starts than in the last 15 years. We're going to continue to focus on policies that have given us more affordable rental housing starts in over 15 years. You know why that is? 
because we're removing the obstacles that they put in place. This isn't about housing for them. It's not Response. about the economy for them, Mr. Speaker. What it's about is not understanding how to build a bigger, better, stronger Ontario, because for 15 years they worked with them and they failed. The final supplementary. Speaker, this is not, and it never has been, about building housing in the province of Ontario. And the people of this province know it. Order. And you know what else, Speaker? And you know what else, Speaker? The member for Sault Ste. Marie will come to order. A number of members down at that end of the chamber will come to order. The member for Ottawa South could come to order. I apologize to the Leader of the Opposition. I know why they're getting so agitated. It's because people in this province, people in this province feel really let down. They feel let down. Stop the clock. I apologize. The member for Kitchener Conestoga will come to order. The Minister of Energy will come to order. We're not going to continue this way. I'm not going to keep interrupting the member who has the floor because of heck excessive heckling. Start the clock. Leader of the Opposition. Yeah, it's hilarious. People in this province, they're suffering. They feel let down by this government. They're hurting. They're frustrated. They're watching a government that isn't helping them but is embroiled in scandals of their own making. They're seeing the pattern of preferential treatment that this government gives to their insider friends and donors. And that's why these undemocratic changes that I've been talking about, this forced sprawl, is being called Greenbelt Grab 2.0. So, Speaker, back to the Premier. Will he stop making excuses for his insider friends and start fixing this mess? The Premier. Mr. Speaker, talk to the 700,000 people that are working the today that weren't to working when you were in government and the Liberals, that you chased 300,000 jobs out of the province. Talk to the people up in Durham that don't have to pay the tolls on the 412 and 418 that you implemented and the Liberals implemented. Talk to the people that 8 million people that got a check back from the government for the license stickers. Talk to the people that fill up every single day and save 10.7 cents per litre that you are against. You're against building homes, building hospitals, building long-term care. You are against absolutely everything in this province. And thank God, thank God we're running the province and not you two that absolutely destroyed the province for 15 years. You destroyed it. Remind the members to please make their comments through the chair. The next question, the member for Hamilton West and Castor Dundas. My question to the Premier. This government unilaterally moved more than 1,000 acres of farmland inside urban boundaries in Wellington County. An internal government memo notes that these changes occurred before the county had completed a land needs assessment and municipal comprehensive review. Instead of letting Wellington County assess where it could grow sustainably and cost-effectively, the government just went ahead and arbitrarily added 1,000 acres to Fergus and Delora. The government doesn't even know the impact on groundwater or the cost of infrastructure. So, Premier, why would your government impose such risk on the people of Wellington County without any evidence whatsoever to support this decision? Reply, the Minister, Minister of Affairs and Housing. Very clear that we intend to build 1.5 million homes across the province of Ontario. We've also made it very clear to our municipal partners that we expect them to work with us. Look, in the members' own home community in Hamilton, despite the fact that their own planners said that they don't have enough land to meet their targets of building homes, they refused to expand their water come to order. So we had to make sure that we did that, Mr. Speaker. You know why? Because Hamilton is expected to grow to over 800,000 people over the next uh, decade. Speaker, it is our responsibility to ensure that there is enough land available over the next two decades to meet the targets that we are setting. Now, we have a very aggressive and ambitious target for 2031, 1.5 million homes to put ourselves 
back on track, Mr. Speaker. We will not be diverted from that, despite the opposition of the NDP and the Liberals, who all they like to Response. do is obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to remove those obstacles, and we're going to make sure our municipal partners work with us to build those homes. Minister of Labour, come to order. The member for Orleans, come to order. Supplementary question. Thank you. Let me set this minister straight. Member Hamilton for Orleans, has come to order. We've exceeded our housing targets within our existing boundaries. And in Belleville, the government ordered the city to sprawl eastward across provincially significant wetlands in the Bell Creek system. The government's own internal memo says there may be legal risk because the decision may not conform with the government's own provincial policy statement. Why is this government forcing Belleville to make changes to its official plan that it knows might be illegal? The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Actually, Mr. Speaker, the City of Hamilton chose to ignore its own planners who very clearly outlined that the existing urban boundaries did not have enough land to meet the long-term housing needs of the residents. Right? Now, what does that mean, colleague? What does it mean? Right? It means that in future years, there is not going to be enough land available. It is exactly why we're in a housing crisis For today. Mountain, you have to just order. admitted to the entire province why it is that you are such a failure in working with them. Because you don't think long term. For you, it's all about today. For us, it's about tomorrow and building a better future for the next generation. Our whole job about being here is working to give the next generation something better than we receive. That's the difference between you and us, and we will not be sidetracked on that. I'm having a great deal of difficulty maintaining my patience, so I'm going to move to warnings. And if you're warned and if, if I have to speak to you again, you'll be named. Order. Start the clock. The next question, member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. The previous Liberal government, with support from the NDP, turned a blind eye as over 300,000 manufacturing jobs left this province. Their policies left us dependent on other jurisdictions for critical goods. In contrast, our government took a proactive and common-sense approach. We recognize that in an area, era of geopolitical uncertainty, we need a resilient manufacturing sector so that we can make products in Ontario again. Under the leadership of this Premier, this Minister and our government, manufacturing employment is now at one of its highest levels since 2008 and is thriving in many parts of our province. Speaker, can the Minister please provide an update on the successes in Ontario's manufacturing sector and their contributions to Ontario's prosperity? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, this Friday our government will join with the hardworking men and women who work in Ontario's world-class manufacturing sector in celebrating Manufacturing Day. And throughout Manufacturing Month in October, we'll recognize the immense contributions made to our economy. Speaker, Ontario is home to more than 814 thousand men and women who turn out finished products every day at our 36,000 manufacturing companies. Here's an interesting fact, Speaker. In July, Ontario added more manufacturing jobs than all 50 U.S. states combined. So to the manufacturing workers, Speaker, we say have a great manufacturing day and thank you for Response. everything that you're doing to support our province. Here, here. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his answer. 
It is great news to hear that our manufacturing sector is thriving again. The previous Liberal government gave up on the manufacturing sector as they watched jobs flee the province thanks to their agenda of higher taxes and more red tape. Under our government, we are witnessing manufacturers investing more in Ontario, and we are continuing to see even more jobs being created in the sector. We cannot afford to lose that momentum. Our government must continue to do all that we can to keep moving forward in building a stronger Ontario. Speaker, can the minister please explain what our government is doing to advance job growth in the manufacturing sector? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development. Speaker, we understand that vital uh, success that comes from uh, these regional communities that we work with across the province. That's why we put a regional development program in place. We've invested $110 million to support 90 companies in the last four years. Those companies themselves have invested $1 billion and created 2,200 good-paying jobs. And our Ontario-made manufacturing investment tax credit is lowering the cost for companies looking to invest in new equipment and new machinery. And by reducing the cost of business by $8 billion annually, we've seen the creation of nearly 40,000 good-paying manufacturing jobs since Spons? we took office. Speaker, we will always support and promote our world-class manufacturing sector. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you very much, Speaker. I want to provide the the opportunity for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing to correct the record. Yesterday, the minister insisted that Mr. Masudi had never been registered to lobby the government. The lobbyist register tells a very different story. It shows that the firm Mr. Masudi owns, Atlas Strategic Advisors, was indeed registered and lobbying the government on behalf of numerous clients between 2022 and 2023. So let's give the minister another opportunity. One more chance, Speaker. Why was Mr. Masudi given a contract to write speeches for the Premier at the same time that he was actively lobbying this government? Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, again, Mr. Speaker, it is actually the individual who lobbies uh, a, a, a member of, of government or a member of the opposition. It's not the company, it's individuals who register with the Integrity Commission. I'd be happy to, uh, to uh, help uh, on that. Mr. Masudi, of course, uh, no longer has a contract with the government. Order. Look, Mr. Speaker, uh, this is all about the same thing, right? It's about the opposition that the NDP have to building homes in the province of Ontario. We were very clear. We made a public policy decision that was not supported by the people of the province of Ontario when we said that we would try to accelerate the building of 50,000 homes on the Greenbelt. That was not supported by the people of the province of Ontario. We apologized for that, and we're moving on. We accepted all 15 recommendations of the Auditor General, but Mr. Speaker, make no doubt about it. We are going to double down in making sure that we build those 1.5 million homes for the people of the province of Ontario. That is a goal that we've had since 2018, and we will not be sidetracked on that mission, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary, back to the member for the Centre. Thank you very much, Speaker. I didn't hear an actual answer in that non-answer. What I heard was excuses, and I heard a technical response. So, Speaker, let's try this one more time. It's worth noting that the government didn't hire Mr. Musadi by name to provide these services to the government following his departure, but instead they hired the company that, they, that he owns, Atlas Strategic Advisors, to write the Premier's speeches and provide communication advice. They, only, they also admitted that this undertaking was already happening just a, a, until a few weeks ago, just a few short weeks. Speaker, that same company is registered to lobby and is actually doing quite a bit of lobbying. In fact, the Integrity Commissioner has been looking into this, and I quote, looking into Atlas Strategic Advisors for allegations of illegal lobbying since June. By the minister's own admission, Mr. Musadi was providing these services Question. only until a couple weeks ago. People deserve honest and lawful government. Does the minister understand that this arrangement with a close friend of the premier could, fit, could potentially be an illegal lobbying? <laughs> Of municipal affairs and housing. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, the commissioner will uh, will investigate that and we'll look at that, Mr. Speaker. Uh, at the same time, Order. the premier was very clear 
Uh, he expected more, and Mr. Masudi is no longer employed by uh, Caucus Research and Services. But make no mistake about it, as I just said, Mr. Speaker, and I'll say it again. Uh, I'm not ashamed of the fact that we have said that we made a mistake when we wanted to build on the Greenbelt. We made a mistake because we want to accelerate the construction of 50,000 homes across the province of Ontario. The Premier was very clear on that. We apologize. We accepted the 15 recommendations of the Auditor General, but make no mistake about it. And I say this very clearly to people who are right now in their parents' basements, students who are wondering where their first home, where their first apartment is going to come, students on our campuses across the province who can't find homes because we can't Spons? get farms built in communities that refuse to build them. We'll untangle the obstacles, we'll get the job done, and we will build for the people of the province of Ontario. That I guarantee you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Sarnia Lambton. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. For far too long, many Ontarians have had to make the decision to uproot their lives and move or face long commutes every day in order to find employment. Unfortunately, this means that people experience the loss of leaving their communities because many businesses are located in large cities or downtown Toronto. Building up communities across our province will help to strengthen our economy and build a stronger Ontario for the next generation. That is why it is important that our government continues to implement innovative solutions that bring economic development opportunities to more communities across Ontario. Speaker, can the minister please share what our government is doing to help bring good jobs to every part of our province? Mr. Labour. Thank you, Speaker. And I'd like to thank uh, that member for his work and for his mentorship. He's been such a strong advocate for Sarnia Lambton. And it's true, Speaker, as someone who's proudly from rural Ontario, we recognize that we need all corners of this province flourishing if we're going to unlock the economic potential and might that is Ontario. And I'm proud, Speaker, to highlight two important funds that our ministry is working on, the incredible teams working on to support rural Ontarians. The Skills Development Fund, which is open right now till November, and the Capital Stream, Speaker. This is making a difference. You know, this morning I just met with beef farmers. Processing capabilities is a big, big issue for so many farmers in communities like mine. We talked about the Skills Development Fund and as an important tool to unlock uh, the capabilities of the next generation in processing. This is just one small example of a difference this government's making to unlock the potential that is rural Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. It's good news that the WSIB head office is moving to London, which will save taxpayers money help workers and also bring more jobs to local communities in southwestern Ontario. Good jobs are a catalyst for reviving neighbourhoods, inspiring communities, raising optimism and creating potential for greater economic and social prosperity. People should be able to work near their families, friends and the places they know and love. That is why our government must continue to deliver on the actions that show respect for the working people of Ontario. Speaker. Can the minister please elaborate and explain how those decisions, such as relocating the WSIB head office to London, would help to build a stronger Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Mr. Hey, Speaker, uh, you know, Speaker, sometimes it's small changes uh, that make the world of difference. It's this premier this government that recognized when you have all the agencies, boards and commission on the most expensive strip of real estate in downtown Toronto, we asked ourselves, is that the best use of taxpayer dollars or employer dollars in the case of the WSIB? The answer, Speaker, is no. We're saving $100 million by moving that facility to London, Ontario. And what does that mean, Speaker? What does that mean? What does that mean? It means we can expand. Maybe if you'd listen, you'd learn something about the firefighters in Orleans that I met with. So that means expanding, expanding thi thyroid, thyroid cancer, thyroid cancer speaker. Speaker, thyroid cancer and pancreatic cancer expanded coverage for firefighters in that member's Fine. community of Orleans. And speaker. We'll take no lessons from a man that can't get the bloody transit in Ottawa right, and he's heckling us. We're going to get workers working in the province of Ontario, save taxpayer dollars. Thank you very much. Once again, remind members to make their comments through the chair.
Thanks. The next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Merci, Thank you, Speaker. Question to the Premier. Earlier this year, the government changed the official plan of Waterloo, Peterborough, Belleville and others, which uh, changed uh, more than 4,000 acres uh, inside urban limits. The government was warned regarding uh, potential litigious question linked to this question. The government was warned that it, uh, relationships with First Nations would be affected. Mr. Speaker, why did the government bring those drastic changes to urban uh, borders despite warnings from its own staff? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. As I just said, Mr. Speaker, like, I, I'm proud of the fact that we are seeing such incredible economic growth in that part of the province, right? Kitchener, Waterloo, southwestern Ontario is seeing tremendous amount of growth. People want to be in that community. Now, it's not just building homes, right? We have to build long-term care homes. I've been in all parts of southwestern, whether from Leamington, Brantford, uh, uh, Brant. We're, we're building long-term care homes in all, of those, in all of those communities because the NDP and the Liberals never made it a priority. We are. I was in Windsor, in, uh, in Windsor opening up Meadowbrook Place, uh, which is the first social housing to be built in that community in over 30 years, wow. Mr. Speaker. Wow. But we need to build more. You know why we need to build more in that community? We need to think about more than just today. We have to think about tomorrow because this minister and this premier are landing Spots. economic development unseen in this province ever. 25, is it $25 billion worth of investment coming to southwestern Ontario? They need places to live, and we will deliver for them in a part of the province that is growing like wildfire. Mr. Speaker, we'll get supplementary question. I have to say, Mr. Speaker, the media qualify the changes to official plans from municipality. They call it Green Belt 2.0. Not only are they attacking the ecosystem and agri um, agricultural lands, but they are also giving a preferential treatment to speculators, enriching these uh, friends to the expense of the public, will the minister examine all modifications brought to the municipal official plans and will he make sure that um, the changes are based on proofs and not on the um, on the government's choices. The opportunity to comment that on that. The only one that has, of course, is Hamilton. And we know why Hamilton is commenting on that, because they disagreed with their own planner's assessment that they didn't have enough land available to meet the long-term goals of housing in their community, Mr. Speaker. So they're fighting us to stop housing from being built in their community, not today, not tomorrow, but in the future, Mr. Speaker. And that is everything that is wrong with the NDP, right? It's everything that is wrong about them. All they think about is today. They have no concern about the future of the province of Ontario. That is why with the Liberals, they helped put red tape in the way. They built up huge debt and deficits. They destroyed the energy sector. They, man they, they Order. wiped out jobs Response. and growth. And it kills them. You hear the member for Orleans, he's so upset that we got 700,000 jobs back in the province of Ontario. Right? He's so upset. I'm not upset. I think it's a good day. The next question, the member for Ottawa, Vanier. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The construction of Highway 413 will require the destruction of sensitive lands currently within the Green Belt. Yet, the Premier has been very clear about his support for this project. The Premier already promised Ontarians that he would not Order. touch the Green Belt and then promised $8.3 billion worth of land to France through flawed and biased process. The Premier recently apologized for removing those lands and has once again committed to protecting the Green Belt. Mr. Speaker, protecting the Green Belt and building Highway 413 are incompatible goals. Will the Premier please be clear with Ontarians? Will he once again remove lands from the Green Belt so he can build Highway 413, or will he learn Order. from his mistakes and finally keep his promise to Ontarians? Order. To reply, the Premier. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, the member from Ottawa uh, maybe forgot back in uh, the election. We won an overwhelming majority, largest since 1929, and it was based the 413 that their government put the originally the original route in. So they flip flop back and forth. We're building the 413. We had a clear mandate from every riding in Mississauga, every riding in Brampton, every riding in Calden. The whole region wants the 413. They don't believe in building. They don't believe in spending $184 billion in building Order. infrastructure. Not only are we building the 413, we're building the Bradford Bypass, we're building Highway 7, we're expanding 401 East out to your area so people can get back and forth a lot quicker. We're expanding Highway 3. We're building this province because it was ignored for 15 years, and we're building homes for the young students that we're going to. Order. Stop the clock. Members will please take their seats. Start the clock. Supplementary question. Thank you for answering, but not answering the question. Mr. Speaker, Ontarians do not need more highways cutting through the green belt. They need more public transit. Highway 413 has been widely recognized as a terrible investment. It is estimated that a cost of over Order. six billion dollars, the new highway would move 7,000 people per hour at peak capacity. But investing the same six billion dollars in public transit instead could move over three times that number of people. This government claims to be fiscally responsible, but it is clear that Highway 413 does not make financial sense for everyday Ontarians. Despite the many questions surrounding this project, the government refuses to provide Ontarians with a clear business plan for it. Will the Premier explain why Ontarians should trust this Question. government decision regarding the Highway 413 when it refuses to be transparent about how much the project will cost taxpayers and how many hectares of prime land will be destroyed? To reply, the Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I can't believe what the members opposite are saying here. I want to take them on a trip through whether it's Brampton or Mississauga. I offer them any, any time, any day of the week, Mr. Speaker. The people of Brampton, the people of Mississauga who are stuck in gridlock. The members opposite are so far out of reality, Mr. Speaker. This is about a project that is going to bring home over $350 million in GDP. We're going to create over 3,000 jobs, and we're going to unlock thousands of homes. We're going to unlock thousands of jobs by building this. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, the members opposite refused to listen to the people of Brampton, Mississauga for 15 years. They never invested in those cities. They never invested in those regions. Under the leadership of Premier Ford, we're building the Highway 413. We're building the Bradford Bypass. We're building new hospitals all across this province. It's Fine. because this government believes in building and investing in infrastructure and transportation, and we will take no lessons from the members opposite on how to do The next question, the member for Windsor to come see. Uh, thank you, Speaker. First, I want to give my appreciation to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing for celebrating the province's investment in 3100 Meadowbrook, truly a home that its residents can be proud of. Yeah, yeah. Speaker, my uh, question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. Speaker, all seniors in Ontario deserve to be treated with dignity and receive the quality of care that they need. The success of investments made by our government into building and redeveloping long-term care homes has become a reality in many communities across the province, including my own with 36 new and 60 upgraded beds at Bruyette Manor in Tecumseh. However, at the same time, Ontario seniors are entering long-term care homes later than ever before, and often with more medically complex needs. Our government must continue to do all that we can to minimize the need for these residents to be transferred to acute care hospitals, because the long-term care homes do not have equipment, supplies, and services that they need. Right. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is supporting long-term care homes to better address the increasing need that, uh, of care for our seniors? Hey. And to respond, the minister of long-term care. 
Well, thank you very much, Speaker. You know, this morning we've had a lot of talk of investing in the next generation, but we also have to remember where we came from. We need to talk about the generation that created us. That's mm -hmm. our seniors, and I'm glad the member asked that question. Let's not forget that the Liberals failed to invest into our seniors. This led to an underfunding of the long-term care sector, huge wait lists, and unnecessary hospitalizations. And in some cases, this forced our seniors to move to long-term care homes way outside their community to receive the That's care that right. they needed. That's why this government is investing over Order. $120 million this fiscal year to support residents with complex medical needs. The member's right. Uh, seniors are living longer. That means there's more complications. That's why this investment includes $20 million into the Local Priorities Fund, a fund that allows Ontario Health to make targeted investments in staffing, equipment, and service services. This Local Priorities Fund had a tremendous first year, supporting 189 projects across the province. We're not going to stop there, Speaker. We're going to continue to invest in our seniors. Right. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for, uh, for giving that answer. It's truly answer. reassuring that the residents with complex needs can receive the care that they deserve in the comfort of a home instead of a hospital. And there are six more new homes being rebuilt and expanded just in the Windsor region alone. Thank wow. you to you, Minister. Thank you to the previous Minister for that. And I've truly seen the impact of the local priorities fund firsthand. The village of Aspen Lake, which coincidentally was where my grandmother lived, is a long-term care home in East Riverside. It's received $199,065 from the local priorities fund to help purchase equipment that will make access to care faster and more convenient. As a government, we must maintain our commitment to ensuring that residents in the long-term care homes get the quality of care and quality of life that they need and deserve both now and in the future. Yes. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how our government is expanding specialized services in long-term care homes that will support residents with complex needs? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and I will elaborate, and, and I will remind this legislature that Windsor, Essex, comes ignored for so long when it came to our seniors, and it took the leadership of this Premier and this Minister of Housing to fix that situation. What the member highlights is exactly those investments, local priorities. He mentioned one very specific to his writing, a wide variety of needs. As seniors aren't uh, at long-term care with the same needs, Speaker. We need to recognize it. That's why we're expanding those specialized services, including our behavior specialized units, an innovative model designed to support residents with complex care challenges like dementia. Speaker, we're not going to stop there. Last week, we were in Cambridge, Kitchener, Guelph. We're going to go across this entire province. We're going to make sure we take care of our seniors with record investments, not just into building homes, but into human health resources. Speaker, I'll remind this House, seniors took care of us. It's our turn to take care of them. That's right. Next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you. Thank you very much. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, the people of Kitchener-Waterloo have been waiting a decade for two-way all-day GO service. Despite Metrolink CEO Phil Verster's promise yesterday that Kitchener-Waterloo would finally get trains, and I quote, every 15 minutes or better on the Kitchener line, the people of KW still have no timeline. Ten years of waiting. Uh, for what we were promised is simply unfair. Yesterday's GO train network outage that caused such chaos is exactly the reason why public, the public requires a comprehensive plan and timeline, and this needs to be very transparent. Uh, too many students, uh, so many students, are left behind and waiting for buses. Those buses are packed. A three-hour commute is not acceptable for the people of Kitchener-Waterloo. To the new Minister of Transportation, when will Kitchener-Waterloo finally get two-way all-day service every 15 minutes as they were originally promised? To respond, the Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. This government has made record and historic investments in Gold Rail Transit across uh, this province. In fact, on the Kitchener line, just uh, a couple of months ago, with the former Minister of Transportation and our entire team, we announced it and uh, the revised uh, station upgrades to, to the Bramley GO station. Mr. Speaker, we appreciate and understand how important this is. That is why we have increased services on the Kitchener line and will continue to make those investments, even though that member opposite has voted against our investments each and every time. When we talk about Gold Rail investment, uh, the increases that we've made in this province, Every single budget or fall economic statement, that member has stood up in this House and voted against that, against that investment. 
That is unacceptable. On this side of the House, we'll continue Order. to make those investments Response. and build transit across this province. The supplementary question. So we'll vote for legislation that works, but right now, nothing is working on the Kitchener line, Speaker. Uh, the president and CEO of the KW Chamber of Commerce said that more trains will deliver, and I quote, up to 170,000 new jobs, billions in new investment uh, from the private sector. Still, there's no train from Toronto to Kitchener in the morning so people can get to those jobs in Kitchener-Waterloo. There's no direct train on the weekends. We don't have a GO station or a plan to ensure safe drop-off and pickups for commuters. The service is slow, it's infrequent, it's unreliable. And we all know that trains are good for business, good for people, and good for the environment. But again, to the Minister of Transportation, why doesn't Kitchener-Waterloo deserve what they were originally promised? And when can they finally expect to see two-way, all-day service every 15 minutes? Stop leaving Kitchener-Waterloo waiting at the station. Mr. Transportation. Mr. Speaker, we are moving forward with uh, two-way, all-day service every 15 minutes again across, across the system. This is something that is really important to us, and we made those investments. And in fact, I'd like to remind that member opposite, every time that we have made investments to improve tracks, to improve platforms across any line, she has stood in this House and voted against each and every single one of those investments. It's a we are going to continue, thanks to the great advocacy of members on that Kitchener line, whether it's the members uh, from Kitchener, from Waterloo, on this side of the House and of this government, we're committed to building that uh, transit system across this province, to, uh, to investing in Goal Rail. And that's why we've also launched the largest uh, investment in public transit in the history of this province. So over $70 billion in the next 10 years are being invested across not only uh, the Kitchener line, but across this province. And every single one of those investments Response. the members opposite have voted no. against, whether it's uh, improving the Kitchener line, whether it's improving Go Rail Transit, whether it's building subways like the Ontario line, the Scarborough extension, there's one common denominator. The members opposite are against building the next question, the member for Don Valley East. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. It seems that every time the Premier makes a major public policy decision, wealthy, well-connected insiders always seem to come out on top. We saw it with the Green Belt, where a small group of insiders became billionaires overnight. Are we really supposed to believe that this decision was about one and a half million homes and not about $8.3 billion? Accordingly, when it comes to the Premier's expansion of private for-profit health care, can we blame Ontarians for wondering where his priorities truly lie? Mr. Speaker, this week, a walking clinic in Ottawa is operating that will charge patients desperate for primary care $400 a year just to have the privilege of paying for visits. And we know that's not the only one of these kinds of clinics popping up in Ontario. To the Premier. While cash for access arrangements may Question. be commonplace within this government, is it fair that he expects the people of Ontario to, to count this as the norm within their own health care system? Okay. Government, health, government House Leader. Coming from the member opposite who just recently endorsed the only person in the province who still supports building on the green belt. What a question from that gentleman. You know what, Mr. Speaker? We have said that we are not going to do that. We are going to continue to make investments in building homes across the province of Ontario. And because of that, we have to make more investments in building hospitals all over. You know why we're doing that? I'll tell you why we're, we're building hospitals and reinvesting in hospitals and long-term care, because for 15 years, the government that you are now in a, a party member of, literally never did it. They built 611 long-term care homes across the province. So I would ask the member this. I would ask the member this. If he could call his partner and say, listen, people have spoken. We need help building homes, but building on the green belt isn't the way to do it. I wonder if he might do that for the, to the person he just endorsed in the Liberal leadership, because I saw the other candidates, and they are simply against that as well. The supplementary question. That's not necessary, Mr. Speaker, because it's not going to happen. But I'd like to remind the Premier of a saying he has burned into the minds of Ontarians this year. He said, all you need is your OHIP card, never your credit card. Kind of reminds me of that famous video where he promised not to touch the green belt, and then he did. History is repeating itself. Walking clinics Order. like the one in Ottawa are just the beginning. Bill 60, 
which was executed swiftly, just like the green belt, was said to be about clearing the surgical backlog, but it's just another cash cow. It opens the floodgates for private clinics to profiteer on publicly funded surgeries, meaning the people of Ontario will be bankrolling clinics that have a financial incentive to provide the lowest quality care possible. Mr. Speaker, Order. the Premier said that real leadership is about being able to admit when you've made a mistake. Will he reverse his decision on private for-profit health care the same way he reversed his decision on the Greenbelt? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Speaker, I want to be very clear, and I want the member opposite and everyone to understand that we have always and we will never tolerate clinics, organizations to charge OHIP funded services. We will make sure that is the case. Having said that, in terms of expanding the access to primary care and to uh, surgical diagnostic centers, 100%. We need to do it. We have done it. You know, I talk about a change that the Premier made in January where we expanded cataract surgeries. We have now, as of that one change, had 19 thousand minor eye surgeries in the province of Ontario because we made an extension in January. We have a plan, Speaker. That plan is working. I understand that the member opposite is Bonds. suggesting that he would like to shut down some of these organizations that have been doing minor surgeries in communities for decades in the province of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Peterborough Kawartha. Thank you, Speaker. <clears throat> My question is to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Oh, great, Minister. Livestock industry is essential to Ontario's agriculture and food industry. In Peterborough County, beef farmers generated over $11 million in farm cash receipts back in 2022. The beef sector continues to be an integral part of my local economy and, of course, of Ontario's growing economy. Can the minister please explain how our government is ensuring that our beef sector continues to fuel our economy and feed our growing population? Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much. And I want to thank the, the member from Peterborough for being a genuine champion, not only of rural communities, but our agricultural industry as well. And he's spot on when he talks about the contributions that Ontario beef farmers make to our overall GDP. And that translates into tens of thousands of jobs right across this province. And Ontario beef farmers understand that they finally have a government that listens and understands. Never was I more proud earlier this year to stand with the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Colleges and Universities to announce a unique initiative whereby the Minister from Colleges and Universities oversaw a partnership between University of Guelph and Lakehead to expand the veterinary program. And my ministry at Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs complements that with a veterinary incentive program to ensure that large animal vets are incented to work in underserviced areas. That's just one example of Response. Another example would be just the briefing I had from the Minister Minister of Labour, where we're talking about how we can better support the growth of the opportunities and capacities of our meat processing plants. More to the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the Minister for her response. It's necessary that our government continues to support our beef farmers from farm to fork, and I personally am going to support our beef farmers from farm to fork to stomach <laughs> today at lunch. Having additional processing capacity and a stable workforce is essential for a growing beef sector for Ontario to make food get to market. Speaker, can the minister please explain how funding initiatives by our government will ensure Ontario is building the capacity that we need to grow this agricultural industry? Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. You know, we're investing heartily because we uh, recognize the opportunities that lie ahead of us. So we just recently announced a $12 million program to enhance processing capacities, not only in our meat processing plant, Speaker, but also with abattoirs across this province. And that builds on a $14 million investment through the Canadian Agricultural Partnership earlier. And this matters why? 
It matters because Ontario beef farmers know they have a government that stands with them as they travel the world to make sure that countries that are looking for good quality beef products come to Ontario first. And that matters because there's a huge opportunity in terms of export, and that translates into jobs right here at home, whether it's Cargill in Guelph, or Cardinal Meats in Brampton, Norpac in Norwich, or St. Helens right here in Toronto. We Spons. are producing from farm to processing plant to table, protein people can count on around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Minister of Energy. Minister recently said he would respect the City of Thorold resolution rejecting the increase of gas burning power capacity in that city. Toronto City Council has twice voted against expansion of gas burning at the Portland's Energy Centre. Will he respect the wishes of Toronto City Council to protect the environment, protect ratepayers' wallets, and protect public health? by blocking expansion of gas burning at the Portland's Energy Centre. To reply, the Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, let me first start by saying that uh, we're very fortunate in Ontario to have an electricity system that is 90 per cent clean, among the cleanest electricity systems, not just in North America, but the entire world, Mr. Speaker. And our intention is to keep it that way because it's attracting new investment into our province, Mr. Speaker. When the NDP and the Liberals teamed up previously and we saw electricity prices soaring, we saw communities that had energy projects forced into their communities. We changed that in 2018 when we became the government, Mr. Speaker. We gave municipalities the ability to make decisions on what would be located in their projects. So in the case of Thorold that the member opposite mentions, we won't be putting a new gas plant in that community because the members of that council have voted no to that. Having said that, Mr. Speaker, we are at the peak of our nuclear Response. refurbishment process here in Ontario, and we're going to need to ensure that we have the power for all the growth that we're seeing, and I look forward to the supplementary. supplementary question. Again, to the Minister of Energy. Uh, the Royal Bank of Canada, the Electricity Distributors Association, have both said it would be effective and cheaper to invest in energy efficiency rather than ramping up gas burning to meet electrical demand in this province. Both recognize that investing in our homes, our businesses, our institutions can cut energy use, save money, protect the climate, and reduce air pollution. Why won't he respect Toronto City Council's resolution to take the cheaper and environmentally better route to meeting energy needs in this city? Minister of Energy. So let's be clear, Mr. Speaker, what the member opposite is advocating for is higher electricity prices and blackouts and brownouts in the City of Toronto. That's what that member is advocating for in that question, Mr. Speaker. We are investing in energy efficiency programs, the conservation demand management programs. We have a billion dollars in that four-year framework, Mr. Speaker, and we're out consulting with municipalities and other stakeholders on a new CDM, energy efficiency program for Ontario. But we saw the track record of the Liberals and the NDP teaming up on energy policy. For many years, Mr. Speaker, electricity prices were soaring in this province, out of control. Manufacturing jobs were leaving for other jurisdictions, Mr. Speaker. Since we became the government, we've seen 700,000 new manufacturing jobs coming to Ontario. Why is that? It's largely because of energy policy that makes sense, Mr. Speaker. That's predictable, that's affordable and reliability, something you won't get with those two. Next question, the member for Brantford Grant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Housing. For people who are experiencing or at risk of homelessness, it is essential that they have access to the right supports and services. While our government has made significant investments in programs to help the most vulnerable Ontarians, the reality is, is that our province needs to continue addressing the issues of affordable housing and homelessness. More resources are needed to build upon the work already underway and to bring forward more solutions to address these serious matters. Our government must continue to demonstrate our firm commitment in addressing housing and service needs for, for the most vulnerable in our communities. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain what, our, what actions our government is taking to increase the availability of affordable housing options and support services 
for those in our province who need it most. Thank you. The Associate Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for Brantford Brant. Yes, he is indeed right. The rise in homelessness throughout our province is compelling. That is why we've been working with our municipal and non-profit leaders like Indwell uh, to tackle homelessness and supportive housing. For example, last March, uh, this government invested $6.8 million in capital spending and capital investment to grow 85 for, for units Hamilton Mountain, we'll come to order. Hamilton. Minister of Municipal Affairs. And in August we'll last year, we invested $270,000 in, in support in uh, operational funding for uh, 40 new supportive housing. So, bottom line, Speaker, is this government has invested $700 million in the last year, up $200 million in the homelessness prevention plan, up 42 percent. We'll always give a hand up to those in need. This government is getting the job done. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Every person in Ontario deserves a safe and affordable place to call home. It's very welcome news that greater funding investments by our government have delivered on providing vulnerable Ontarians with the supports they need for housing, as well as mental health and addictions care. However, the nature and scope of homelessness is different in every region. There is not a one-size-fits-all solution, and that's why our government must continue to work closely with community partners to make the most impact in reducing and preventing homelessness. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain how our government is working with municipalities and the nonprofit sector in addressing housing needs and support services for individuals and families in our communities? Thank you. Associate Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member from Brantford Brant for his question. When it comes to homelessness and support of housing in Ontario, the need has never been greater. That is why I've been meeting with municipalities, mayors, councillors, and supportive housing managers throughout this province, and I've been encouraged, frankly, by the collaboration all have shown from all levels of government. For example, Speaker, last week I was in St. Thomas in my riding of Elgin, Middlesex, London, where we announced $1.2 million of supportive housing for 45 new units at the station. Um, you know, when we got together, we're very excited. The mayor was there, 200 people showed up, community leaders, Indwell leadership was there. It's something to behold. It's a great example. We invite everyone to come to St. Thomas. Again, Speaker, those in need will always get a hand up from this government. We are committed to housing stability throughout this province. We will Once. get the job done. Thank you. Next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Superior North. Thank you to the Premier. According to recent Food Banks Canada report, 43 percent of people in Ontario feel they are worse off than last year. The evidence? Food banks are struggling across the province. The director of Thunder Bay's Regional Food Distribution Centre notes that over the next four years, their costs will increase by 80 per cent. Incredibly, since 2021, the London Food Bank has seen a 91 per cent increase in people coming to them for food. So no, things are not a thousand per cent better than when the Premier took office five years ago. The NDP has a plan to address this crisis by doubling OW and ODSP and implementing real rent control. When will Order. the Premier stop the gravy train for his friends and take the obvious and necessary steps to address food insecurity Question. in this province? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Well, thanks very much, Speaker, and I thank the honourable member for the question. Mr. Speaker, I would just like to remind the honourable member that it was her and her party that have voted against the 5% increase and another 6.5%, the largest increase in ODSP rates in decades in the province, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. It's this government Order. and this party that's fighting to make life more affordable for Ontarians. But along the way, Mr. Speaker, you've discovered this all day, all, all week, the week before. They're against housing. They're against long-term care. They're Order. against school. And they're now clearly showing they're against the people of this province for us to be able to lift them out of poverty, to make sure that we provide the support for people who need them. The largest increase Order. in support in social assistance, every single member across voted against us. Sure. But, Mr. Speaker, that's okay, Response. because the Ontarians elected this government, yeah. members of this caucus and the majority middle to stand up for every single person in this province, and we won't let them down. Yeah. 
concludes our question period for this morning. A couple of members.